Good morning, Sabbath School. We have a really neat opportunity this morning to uh, introduce to you one of the newest staff members of our Village Seventh-day Adventist School. And we want to welcome everyone that's watching online as well as those that are present here at the Village Church. Um, but we have made a decision, even though the property and the place is not totally worked out for the new direction of our school, which is to be a much more nature-centered catalyst for learning. We've moved forward as a church uh, board and school board, and we have stepped out, I believe, in God's providence and in faith. And not only have we brought back all of our teachers to fulfill every grade, but we've gone beyond that, and we've hired a science and nature specialist who will be with us for this next year and hopefully many years to come, Katie Roddy. And so Katie is here in the pink. Good morning, Katie. Welcome to Berrien Springs. We're glad to have you this morning. Thank you. It's good to be here. And where'd you spend your summer at? I spent my summer on the farm ranch in North Dakota, western North Dakota. And it was a good time because you told me this morning it went by too fast. Yeah, I was here, and then I was there, and then I was here again suddenly. I thought, well, I was just here. What happened? But good, it was good to be there, but good to be here now. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you here. We've uh, enjoyed our interactions with you, many and varied, and we're looking forward to a great year. And, of course, the ministers and teachers meetings will be happening this next week, so you'll be a part of that. The teachers and the pastors will be spending a day together uh, in the middle of that week, which will be wonderful. And certainly as a local church, we're constantly looking to strengthen that team effort. And what a privilege it is to have everybody here today. So let's pray. And then we're going to get a little better acquainted with you. And we're also going to get a little bit of acquaintance with what we've done and what we're doing that's coming up. So Mr. Bugby, our principal, would you have prayer to start our Sabbath school? Father God, again, we come to you with great praise and thanksgiving in our hearts for calling us into your house of worship. Um, and as was spoken today during uh, the message, we have so much to be thankful for in terms of the freedom we have to worship you according to your word. And we just pray, Lord, that that will continue. And we pray, Lord, that as we study your word in Sabbath school, as we talk about the school, that your spirit will brood over us, uh, that spirit that gives us peace uh, joy and courage, Lord, in these times when we need courage. We thank you, Lord, for all of those involved with ministry uh, here at the church and school, and we pray as we talk about the school that your Holy Spirit will enlighten us so that our school can be all that you intend it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so I want to I start by getting a little better acquainted with you before we go into some of the things you'll be intricately involved in. So uh, you've done a lot of things. You studied biology and chemistry. That was a great experience for you. You were very successful at it. Uh, I like to brag on you when you're not around. I won't do as much of that here online, but uh, you enjoyed those scientific studies and did very well at them. But after you graduated college, you've had some unique experiences. Tell us a little bit of what makes you tick and where you've been and what you've done. Yeah, so right after I graduated from college, well, during college, I had always had this dream of I want to go be a student missionary, kind of because everybody does it. Um, but the one year kind of stuck in my mind. But I always prayed, and I never really felt like there was the place that I really wanted to go. I said I would never be a teacher. Ha, ha, ha. God's <laughs> laughing at me now for sure. <laughs> with me. He's laughing with me. Um, so... <clears throat> I said, you know, I'm not going to go to a school, I want to do something else, and I was coming up to graduation, and I thought, I've never done this thing that I've really wanted to do, um, God, you got to open something up. So I graduated in December, and then planned to go to graduate school after that, but you can't start graduate school in January, where I was planning to go. So I thought, I'll just wait six months, and this is perfect opportunity to be a missionary for six months. Also, I shouldn't plan my life. <laughs> my planning doesn't work out quite like God's planning does. So I ended up um, going to a school, once again, to be a teacher, um, a missionary training school in Belize, Central America. And I ended up staying not for six months and not for a year. Um, but for several years, I was down there for four years. 
And that's where I spent a lot of my first mission years, but then connected with that school. I traveled to various parts of the world. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of my mission experience. And then later, I came back to the United States um, and I worked for a couple of years um, with Spanish-speaking students who were trying to learn English. And then I went back into the mission field and I was working in um, Colombia, South America, um, but due to the country closing down and a lot of things that were happening, I ended up coming back to the States. Um, worked in Milwaukee, Wisconsin this last year, teaching first and second grade, and then God opened doors for me to come here. Amen. And uh, I want to say thank you to Clyde and Melissa Morgan, who connected the dots for us to get to know you. And then I want to uh, thank the Michigan Conference, who is partnering with us in this, and they very much support our efforts to take so much of the good curriculum we already have and build on it and develop out even more excellent curriculum and opportunities to connect with God in creation. Now, you grew up on a farm, which means you're not intimidated by big equipment. I've, I've kind of always been that country girl. Um, I'm not a big city girl at all. I can manage. But yeah, I get in a little dirty and get my hands greasy and having my hair so matted with dirt I can't comb through it. That's kind of normal for me. So you not only know how to work on those things, but drive them. You did that in the mission field. I also like to tell people that you're a welder. You know how to weld. Most I, men don't know how to I know to how to stick two pieces of metal together. Okay. Well, you're being modest. That's good. The, the, the persona that I'm trying to build or reveal is that you're quite comfortable in what I'll call non-normal situations. You've had to deal with a lot of things. You're a can-do person. You're well-trained in the sciences. You love the discovery of God in nature. And now you're gonna to get to be a part of a cutting-edge program with so many seasoned teachers that are you know, moving this way already. And this team is going to work together to help our kids really discover Jesus and his amazing creation. And you're there as a science and nature specialist. And it's terribly imperative that we communicate that uh, while we're going to delve into nature an awful lot, the academics, the excellence of learning that's going to be a part of what we're doing is going to be of the highest order. I'd like to give our principal and our chairperson, they've been a part of this journey, they're beginning to know you, each of them just a moment to uh, make any observations that I might not have made because we've discovered some really neat things as we've gotten to know you. Stacy. Um, in working with our students last year, building our outdoor education program, it's become very evident that incorporating this aspect greatly increases the students' learning in all areas. And so we look forward to Katie furthering our education to higher standards than what we already are at. Amen. And Mark? Well, one of the things that has impressed me about Katie for the time that I've known her is just her dedication and commitment. Um, right from the very beginning, you could tell that she was going to be willing to put all she could of herself into this. And, and because it is new and because it is cutting edge, it's going to take that. <laughs> but at the same time, you can see from her experience and from what she shared that she depends upon the Lord as well. So, you know, it's those things together that have impressed me and, and I believe will be a, a winning combination for wow, us. Wow, that is so well said. Thank you. You know, you're making me think of Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, where he describes 15 companies that outperform the stock market year after year. And uh, the people you get on the bus, the team you build is so important. But he tells the story of a steel company that uh, was operating in Lafayette, Indiana. And they hired farmers because they found it was easier to teach steel making skills than work ethic. And you're talking about a big job. And so a farm girl is probably a pretty good persona for where we're going because this is going to be a pretty big mountain to climb. And hard work has been a part of everything our school has been about. And it's only going to get to where we need that uh, ethic all the more. All right, well, we have four different things we want to highlight this morning that Katie will have her hands in, for sure, along with some of our other teachers. And uh, Lift Camp is the first one we're choosing. Lift Camp takes place at uh, 
at Campus Sabal. Tell us a little bit about it, Mark or Stacy. You're familiar. Well, to be with honest, it. I'm probably not the one to tell you about that because they didn't have Lift Camp. Oh, they didn't have last it last year. year. Well, let's talk so about it. So probably Stacy's more. You know, uh, Lift Camp is not something I've experienced. Okay. I've heard about it. I've heard things, but I haven't experienced it nor been involved with it. So. Fair enough. Having taught seventh and eighth grade for many, many years, I've participated in many lifts. Lift stands for Lifestyle Improvement for Teens, and it's a program to re-emphasize to the seventh and eighth graders that you know that you don't have to take part of the things in the world. You can live a lifestyle free of drugs. You can live a lifestyle full of exercise and healthy living and good food and teaching those skills as to how to proceed. We te- they're taught how to cook. They're taught how to exercise. So here they're taught how to work. Yes, they're and they're also the taught how to work. Let's see a few more. Here's one where they're teaching them some of the same skills Dr. John Kelly was teaching doctors and nurses. Yep. It's a good thing. It's a great program, and we look forward to the students going every year because they start the year off with uh, outdoors. They started off bonding together and learning how to participate. All right, so some wonderful worship services here. Pastor Chad Bernard leading out, and they make some decisions. That's good. All right, let's go on to the next thing here. Uh, we made our initial trip to the Florida Keys this year. That was quite an experience. And uh, Mr. Bugby, uh, where is this? So that is the, the church there. Um, and you can see at the church there in that last slide, there was a wall, which a fence. Well, actually. let's go farther. I think we got a better picture. And, and so that fence, um, as you can see, was unstained. And we spent all Sunday staining that, that wall and uh, also doing landscaping. Now, one of the things that I think Stacy or one of the other staff members uh, recognized that was really important in this mission project that we did is the ch- local church itself started doing work because once they saw that we were invested in their church they themselves became more invested isn't that in a our great church. thing i mean let the, be not don't let nobody despise your youth but be an example in speech and conduct and all holy behavior so these young people were a huge boost and uh here's our campsite it won't take too long I'm uh, cooking over the campfire right by the ocean. Here we are underwater. Let's see, is this a video? Some of these are. Okay, a little bit of snorkeling. We go to Christ to the Abyss. This is a cement statue about 20 feet down. Kids got to swim down, examine the coral. They got to see a variety of sea life. Uh, this uh, horseshoe crab was very much alive. And... Uh, I just make a mention on the Christ of the Abyss. It, 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 there was a spiritual lesson in that, in that that gentleman who put these, there's actually three of those statues around the world. One that is there in the Florida Keys. <clears throat> but on our way out, um, the, the boat people were kind of joking about the touchdown Jesus. So that made me think that oftentimes your experience with Jesus will depend on how you view him and what your perception of him is. So in this case, you know, they were kind of laughing about the touchdown Jesus where, um, you know, we're trying to lead our, our uh, children, our, our young people to Jesus, the risen Christ, who's coming again. Amen. And all the work he went to, it's a testimony of somebody's belief in the primacy of Christ the Creator. All right, we've got a few more here. I got to be with the dolphins and uh, interact with them. It was a pretty awesome experience. Most adults don't get this privilege, but as a church, we could offer it. Now we're coming up to something new. Uh, Stacy, tell us a little bit about what we're going to have here. In the first week of October, our students in sixth grade are going to travel down to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, and these are some of the sites they're going to see. I had the privilege of going down and kind of doing a a preamble visit one weekend uh, several months ago. This is one of the great rooms inside Mammoth Cave. And when we went, most of the cave tours were still closed because of COVID. And this is the one, the the general uh, exhibit tour that was open. However, they are hoping to have our students do several behind the scenes tours while we're down there. And uh, they'll get to not only do this cave, but then there'll be opportunities for some students who want to do a crawl cave. I won't be going on that. Um, there'll be horseback riding. There'll be, be the opportunity for some zip lining for those that don't want to crawl through a cave. All right. So um, one of the nice things is that we've found that the naturalists here are willing to work with us in regards to our creation 
understanding of origins. And uh, this is a beautiful thing. It's a chance for us to witness, a respectable witness, that we do believe there's a creator that made all of this. And uh, so the kids are actually getting a chance to be schooled in a proper understanding of how things came into being. All right, super. A few more pictures here. It's going to be a beautiful and unique experience for them. And you came across a big tree. There are actually five people around that tree. That's how many hands it took. And you can see they're, still, they're stretched pretty far. Now, one of the neat things, uh, I saw it first with Mr. Bugby. Um, some of our other teachers were probably already on to this, but I know we're going to have our own uh, village pastor teacher retreat for a day and a half. And uh, we're going to enjoy some really neat interaction. But, you know, when I look at that tree, I can't see the leaves. I can only see the bark. And the question comes, what kind of tree is that? Well, these uh, amazing advances in technology can be good. And when I've seen some of these naturalist apps that you were introducing us to, the kids are going to get a chance to really actually get answers. Uh, you brought up one that I thought had a very unique name in a meeting we were in this week. It was called Snake something. Oh, Snake Snap. It's this app that I started using this year because this year, out of the 10 years we've lived here, we usually see one snake. We've seen a lot of snakes this year on our property. So I've taken to identifying them because I want to know what can hurt and what can't. And uh, it's within 20, they say 24 to 48 hours, but within 20 minutes, I'm getting a response of what the snake is. You can interact with the person that's responding to you and uh, they'll tell you about the snake and answer any questions. So we're living in a pretty awesome age to encounter nature, really as long as we're not uh, bedazzled by the superficial virtual out there that uh, is Satan's counterfeit to all of this. All right, well, let's move on to our last item, a little bit more inside the ground pictures there. But we're coming up to our Boundary Waters trip, which isn't that many weeks away. And I know, Mr. Bugby, you've been a part of that. Yeah, it's an excellent um, opportunity. And one thing I, I want to make sure everybody understands that the trips, as, as awesome as they are, they're not an end into themselves. They are a vehicle or an instrument to lead our students closer to Christ. I mean, it is amazing to be underwater, you know, near the Christ of the abyss and see all these beautiful fish and, and to be in the boundary waters where you're, 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 you can wake up in the morning and hear no sounds or hear the sounds of a loon. But they are a vehicle to lead our children closer to Christ. And the boundary waters is just an amazing one because... The, um, it's so pristine. And so we've tried to incorporate this into the curriculum with Katie here as our science and nature specialist. We're going to do even more of that. The local regional history, uh, the dynamic of the fur traders and the local geology, and even the current modern day battle over whether or not to mine up in this community. It's going to create some really neat opportunities. Now, this is one of my favorite campsites. Those young people are sitting there looking across the Basswood River at Canada. And not too far up this river, which is what they're on, are some petroglyphs, some uh, ancient Indian drawings. And when it's all said and done, the confidence that comes out of this, that they don't need to have a cell phone signal, to have a good experience, and they can overcome adverse circumstances. We gather on the water. After we broke camp to have worship, we have memory texts. This year we'll be reading a book called God's Smuggler. If you want to read along with us, it's an amazing book. And uh, we end the weekend together. Now, we have nearing probably 90 people going on the trip this year, which is an awful lot of groups. And uh, we'll come back together on the Sabbath. We'll share Sabbath school where we study the lesson in church. We'll go on a hike out to uh, Kawishui Falls, which is right here. And we'll come back and enjoy a final moment or two. This is our last slide. I believe that's uh, the Freemans as they're paddling either in or out of the boundary waters. And we're looking forward to an, a, an experience with God that leaves the digital craze behind and encounters the quiet, the power, the rugged beauty of creation. So our enrollment's looking good at the school. How are we doing? Yes, we're, we've really been blessed. You know, last year... Uh, enrollment was down, as you all know, and, and COVID was the primary um, cause of that. Um, but this year, it seems like we've rebounded quite well. You know, we're still uh, hoping that 
we could even go further, but we're right now around 140. Um, there are a couple things that we would like prayer for yeah. um, and, and to make people aware that maybe you can even be involved with one of these things. The first thing is the prayer for the situation with COVID. Right now, it's looking very positive, but as we know, things can change overnight. In fact, you know, you're hearing all the stuff on the news right now. It's again, it's, it's looking very positive. We're just praying that a, my watchword last year was to have the least restrictive environment. And that's what we're still striving for. And so we can be praying for that. And I want to interject there real quick before you go to the next thing. When I listen to the news and I hear about people getting back into the classroom, I'm thinking to myself, we were in the classroom pretty much the whole year. Mitigating risk, managing situations, and I just want to affirm our teachers and our leadership for that. Yeah, so we just, we just want to praise God for that because it was him, because there are other schools that were out pretty much the whole year. So we're very uh, blessed and, and thanking him for, the, for that blessing. Um, the other thing is we have a couple, a few positions in Extend Ed and um, an assistant cook, which, you know, we have one person that's, that's applied for that, but, but we still need personnel here because those uh, ancillary positions are very important to the They're school They're part of the, the community of the school. They interact sure. with the kids. They, they, they support the overall discipleship program that's going on, and it's valuable. Very valuable. I had, I had someone call from uh, um, Elizabeth Carr, who was one of our extended workers last year, and I was able to give her a glowing reference. And, and because that is such an important role because uh, parents depend upon that extend ed workers in order to be able to have their students stay longer than the than the typical school day so those those positions are are super important and we just need we would request that you guys would be praying for that and if you or someone knows of someone who would be like like to be involved with those we would be happy to talk to you all right so get a hold of the school if you don't have that number uh, look on the back of your bulletin and let's make contact. All right, any closing thoughts for this new school year? Looking forward right. to a great year. All right, our, our chairperson says looking forward to a great year. Katie, we're so glad you're part of our church family. And uh, we think that what's in front of us is the best year yet. So I'm so proud of our uh, educators. And I mean, they are just... They have put, they were already godly committed people. They put their arms around going to higher ground and they are bringing in so much of their rich experience with God and with education. And it's just exciting to see what's happening at the school. So I just make one, one comment in that, um, you know, we were really excited about the land and, and, and moving and all that. But, uh, and I don't know what God has in store. I don't, I don't think any of us know for sure. But the primary key to what we are doing is the teachers. They are on the front line. They are the ones that are going to make the difference. And we will work diligently with the resources we have. And, and here in Southwest Michigan, we're tremendously blessed. There's Daily Bread. There, there's Andrews, um, you know, the campus. There's all kinds of places around here that we can use. And while it's true, if we had a piece of land, we, it would be much more accessible. Um, our teachers are the key ingredient and, and we'll make use of, of the places we have around until such time God sees fit to, to bring us to that place, that promised land, Amen. so to speak. And, <laughs> and I want to affirm the church for their support prayerfully and financially. We are still actively looking. Our church school is being examined uh, by architects relative to a potential transition of ownership. We won't do anything without bringing it before a church and business session. But uh, it's definitely something that prayers need to continue on. God in his providence has made a way for us to continue engaging our young people and going to higher ground. We'll put our vans to good use. We'll put our shoe leather to good use. And we'll use all the creativity that God's given our teachers. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing Katie to us. Thank you for our principal, our school board chair, and all of our teachers. And the rest of our staff, Lord of which we highly prize their contributions and gifts and skills. Bless them. Uh, may there be a sweet unity, continued depth of experience, beautification through this harmony of working together. And bless this new school year, Lord. May it indeed be the best. May we be preparing our young people to stand their place in these end times. And may they know that Jesus lives. He's an awesome creator. 
and they will know their duty and their destiny to the one that loves them so much. Bless us to that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. And we'll now transition to our lesson. If you have your Sabbath school lesson, be sure and get it out. We certainly do want to engage the floor. So uh, please acknowledge if you have something to share, and we will begin our Sabbath school time together. general lesson has been rest in Christ and we're coming to a week about wearing the yoke with Jesus now I know that one of our members actually brought in a yoke which is being used in another room and in the dialogues with my wife who's teaching in another room this morning she commented that William Barclay in his commentaries referencing to this point said that the yokes were actually fitted for the oxen that would wear them, which I found to be a particularly beautiful truth, the idea that God creates exactly the right fit for the burdens he gives me to carry. So this morning's lesson, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, July 24 to 30. All right, so we do have a microphone. Finn Dronin will come to you if you have a comment to share. Uh, before we actually go into the lesson, though, let's uh, ask God to guide us. And I'm going to ask Pastor Paige if you'd pray for our lesson study. Gracious Father, we thank you so much that we could be here this morning to break the bread of life. We ask for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide and open our minds to new lessons that we may gain from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Sabbath lesson. We've just read or repeated the text. Uh, the first paragraphs there on Sabbath say, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a wonderful promise we've been given here by Jesus. After all, who among us at times hasn't felt heavy laden? If not so much with work itself, though that can often be the case, but with the labor and heavy ladenness that life itself brings. And Jesus here is telling us that, yes, he knows what we're going through, and yes, he can help us, that is, if we let him. So, you know, every, every day at our house, one of the things we read for our devotional time are the Ellen White helps for the Sabbath school lesson. Now, if you're not getting those, I'd like to encourage you to get online, go to the ABC, and get the Ellen White helps for the Sabbath school lesson. Uh, I know I had a little epiphany listening to those this week. Sometimes I read them, sometimes my wife, sometimes my daughter. But as I was listening to them this week, I, I had my own personal spiritual awareness moment. And that was very important to me. And I, I, I'm not so sure that it was like I hadn't, I couldn't have gotten there. But while I was listening to Ellen White talking about the the fact that the yoke of Christ doesn't diminish our, our necessarily our committedness or our earnestness, maybe even our busyness, it, it is light. And as we sat around uh, this week talking about what we read, uh, it was quite a little moment. So maybe somewhere along the way in the lesson here today, I'll share my little epiphany. Until then, let's go to Sunday's lesson. I will give you rest. It says, read Matthew 11, 20 28, where Jesus says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is the context of this statement, and how does Jesus give us rest? All right, what's the context? John? I'm glad that the lesson actually brought out the context of it, because so many times we could read a scripture, and we kind of get an understanding of it, but it may not be really what the context was. And in this case, the... In Matthew, he records that Jesus was actually calling out the cities who were not really paying attention to him. In other words, they were rejecting him. 
And he says that it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than what it was for them in so many words. And if, if we could go there real quick and sure. just take a look at, at one of the things that he said. Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11, and, and the lesson says go from 20 to 28. So we'll, we'll kind of cruise in that area for a second. It, it says in verse 24, after he lists the cities, Chorazon, Capernaum, Tyre, and Sidon, and, and, and juxtapose those against each other, it says, by saying to you that it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee at that time. So in other words, at the same, same area, same time frame. In other words, Jesus is going to say something that's going to apply to what the people rejected. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and to he to whomsoever the Son reveal him. And then it says, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so the context of this says that if you're heavy laden, you're actually kind of participating in the thing that these cities that he calls you out on. You're, you're actually part of that. And he's saying you can come out of that. And I think it's really interesting that Christianity is the one religion where we always say that we have a God who comes and seeks us out. You know, we look at the Garden of Eden where God came and sought us out, but there's still this element where he says that you have to come unto me. And at that point, he'll give us rest. So the context is saying that Jesus recognizes that the people have slipped far away from the truth, so that they look at truth and they despise it, and they look at error and they embrace it. And they call error truth and truth error. And he says that the Father has shown the simple that there is a correct way. And if you are willing to look at that, if you're willing to get a converted mind, you can now take the yoke of Jesus upon you and have that rest that he was talking about. All right, so Jesus would say that the Pharisees will bind burdens on people that they won't live with their little finger. So in the midst of this spiritual darkness, there is a spiritual burden on people. They're not free, they're not happy, they're not joyful. They're, they're, Jesus will go so far... It's amazing what he does. He does not destroy confidence in the church, but he basically says, you've got to go higher than your church leaders are taking you. Mm -hmm. And to the woman at the well, we say you have to worship in spirit and truth. So this spiritual darkness, this refusal to accept light is to keep the people in bondage, in heaviness. And for Jesus, that's a big deal. So there is this context of woe unto. And the truth of the matter is the liberty of shedding wrong burdens comes with the conviction of love to identify what those are. And rejecting Christ was to leave these people in darkness and burdenness, burdensomeness. You know, his whole ministry all the way up to this time, he was, he was revealing the character of his father. He was revealing the true nature of God through a demonstration of his life. And in that, he's offering them an invitation to come. And, and he's rebuking these cities because he's made it very clear to them and they were crying out for being in bondage to Rome uh, under the Roman yoke, and here he comes to offer them something easy and freedom, and they don't want to be free from it. They really didn't want to be free from sin, and that's what he was pointing out to them. And uh, um, I, I read something out of the Desire of the Ages this morning. We were talking about this last night as well, about their, their response to Christ in this way. Um, God's will is not for sin to have dominion over us. And he wants to set us free. But in order for us to be free, we have to come. You know, that's the condition. We've got to come to him, but we have to recognize our need. In Desire of the Ages, page 329, it says, Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before God. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will be, you will become in his strength. And the heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest and casting them upon the burden bearer. But there's that recognition of the need within. And then we will come to the great burden bearer. All right, so we can, um, we can go to Calvary and find our burdens lifted. All right, any other thoughts, Mark? Yeah, so, so in the context here, he's talking about his relationship with the Father, 
And what was that mission that the Father had given him? And he, Jesus said it was to seek and save the lost. Well, when you're lost, you're confused. You don't, you don't really know where you are. You don't know um, how to get to where you're going. And I think that's what happens with burdens. We don't know how to deal with them. And Jesus said, you know, if, you know, you, you're, the very hairs on your head are numbered. So why do you worry about these things? So we're going to be talking about the yoke, but there are definitely burdens that we carry that God never intended us for us to carry. And then he said, those are the ones I want you to lay at my feet. Because, um, and Dennis just shared that, you know, those, those anxieties, those things uh, in our lives that he wants us to give to him. Uh, you, you all know that poem, The Footprints, which is very inspiring to me because that poem says that when things get toughest and we think we're walking alone, that's when Jesus is actually carrying us. Amen. Beautiful. It's all about perspective. Comment from the floor. Red microphone. Thank you. I think that as we take in the context of this chapter, that what we are really seeing a contrast between is how heavy is it a burden to believe contrasted to how heavy is it a burden to disbelieve. And frankly, as I have been studying this comparison between Matthew 5 and 2 Peter chapter 1 with the spiritual ladder and the Beatitudes, one of the things that I had to struggle with myself was come to a realization that it takes faith to believe I am poor in spirit. And so what Jesus is trying to tell them is if you come to me, you who are poor in spirit but don't know it yet, you can find rest, but it will take faith to acknowledge the truth of the diagnosis. Amen. So at some point in time, there's a risk. You have to find out if God is real. So you take a step. And uh, in taking the step, he either shows up and fulfills his promises or he doesn't. All right, let's go on to Monday's lesson, Take My Yoke Upon You. Why does Jesus command us to take his yoke right after he's invited, to, uh, invited us to give him our burdens and find true rest? All right, why, why, why immediately a symbol of work? Go ahead, John. I, I was, as I was reading this over this week, um, today's part of this lesson, uh, Monday's, the thing that fazes me the most is, is that, you know, this is an ox that we're referring to. And this ox is plowing a field, and he's doing work on this field, but it's not necessarily for himself. Um, the ox isn't necessarily doing everything for himself. In fact, he's not really doing anything for himself. When Christ asks us to take his yoke upon us, it is a yoke of selflessness. When we're so concerned about our selfishness, the burden is always heavy, but when we're concerned about Christ and his work, the burden is always light. It, it requires a different kind of a mindset, a different thing, and, and it, it, it requires that ox mentality of we are pulling together. Um, of course, it, it's Christ's yoke because he's the one who's actually working with us, converting us, changing us, bringing us into his image. But the fact of the matter is we walk in partnership with him, even though we don't have much to bring. By being under that yoke, we are still at one with him. And that's why he asked us to do this, because he came down to this earth and he says, my father works, and so do I. And so when we take his yoke upon us, well, Christ works, and so do we. Um, we do it not because of, well, we're doing it because we're saying, thank you, Lord, or we're doing anything else. It's natural to do that, because the yoke is on both of us together. So as we both go together, as this ox plows the field, there is a harvest that comes. And I think that's what Jesus is, one of the things that Jesus is getting at. It's awfully much deeper than that as well. Okay, so partnership in a divine purpose. We've got a comment on the floor right here, Brother Burns. Oh, um, right here with Vaya. Go ahead. When a yoke is put on an oxen, they're in training. Mm -hmm. And God, when we come to God, we become, we enter a, a training field. And some of the training is done in the classroom, but the most... Uh, effective training is done in the field. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to wear, if you will, the yoke. 
Very excellent point. Um, indeed, getting out into the field and working is, is a form of training. And it, it, I think in ideal situations for the Christian, you know, now, uh, there, are, there are still places where they use these methods for sure. I've, I've driven all across India, and uh, there are plenty of places where they're still using oxen to do the work. I'd like to think that in the Christian setting that there's actually a bond that develops deeply between uh, the people that are m- and, and the animals that they're using. Um, there's, there's something about that bond, I think, too, that's coming out of this. But indeed, uh, it is a journey of training. Historically, in South Africa, we had the Dutch settlers. They called them Voer Trekkers. Now, Voer Trekkers is moving forward. They had wagons with six pairs of yokes. So they had 12 oxen pulling their wagons. So the yoke that Christ is talking about is initially his willingness, his pure willingness to be yoked with his Father. And what he is also saying is, there's room for you because there's more yokes for us to work in unity towards an objective. Amen. Very good. May we each wear our past page. You know, when I, you were talking about ever plowing with the oxen and when I was over in Africa I actually got to do this and it was quite difficult holding that plow Um, it was amazing that they always took a weaker ox and yoked him up with a stronger one one more experienced and that's what Jesus is wanting us to do is yoke up with him because he's experienced he's gone through all the temptations that we're gonna face in life and he says come come yoke up with me I'll show you how this can be easy for you and he strengthens us as we go. That, that younger, inexperienced ox was constantly learning from the older brother, you could say. And he was getting stronger each day. And that, that ox, he, was, he knew right where to go. He didn't have to crack him with a whip or anything. He, he knew his job. He knew how to accomplish it. And uh, he'd just pull you right on through. And you really had to hold on to that thing. So... I look at yoking up with Christ as finding rest, being relieved of my burdens, because he's going to provide me opportunity to gather gather strength and courage. And from that, I can become one with him. And yes, through that process, there's a harvest. And we we all get to look forward to that joy of how that harvest comes to fruition through our labor together with Christ. All right, very good. Melody. Yes, I appreciate all the points I've heard so far. That was a blessing. But when I was reading this too last night, what struck me was when we come to Christ and accepted Him as a Savior, we kind of like, I'm free. I am now free. Free to do what? Free to do whatever I want? No, free to come under His yoke. It's like... Um, What's most of the Christian world today is like, I'm free now, I'm under grace, I'm fine now. So, but to me, it, it spoke to me as free, but we are yoke up to Christ. And that is purpose and ownership. In the Philippines, if there is a, if there is a cattle running around without a yoke or a tag, you're free for all. I mean, everybody can claim you, but it's nice that Christ <laughs> has already made a claim on us. Amen. All right, Mark? We sing that song, you know, Jesus loves me, they are weak and he is strong. Do we really believe it? Do we really believe that, as Jesus said, without me you can do nothing? You know, we might be able to preach an amazing sermon and uh, win people to Christ, uh, you know, witness, whatever it is, but the truth is, without him, there is really no forward movement. And if you think of it, you know, he's that big, huge ox. We're that little ox. Basically, we're kind of just running on his strength. Um, otherwise, you know, we really don't believe that without me, you can do nothing. Amen. I just wanted to echo what Mark was saying there. It's, it's this whole thing about belief. We, we do have a hard time with belief. One of the really neat things here is that when you take these two ox together, or, or multiples, however you want to say it, the lead one... The other ox have to believe in him. Otherwise, you can't make a straight line. Yes, 
They have to believe his leading. And you have to not question his leading. You have to know it by experience that that ox is going to get you there every single time and never even think about it. And so many times I think in our Christian walk in life, we don't actually believe. We say we do because we know something in the Bible or we've read the spirit of prophecy, but we don't actually believe that that ox is leading us the way how we should be going. And as a result of that, the yoke becomes very difficult. But when we come to him, and that means when we unload all the other things that are going to keep us away from him, when we finally shed those and we say, Lord, enough of that, I want to be under you, and we really believe it, then we can take that yoke and we can walk at the speed that he leads us, the direction that he leads us, the place that he leads us, in order to get the ultimate harvest, which is all of us going to that place that he has prepared for us. So it's that whole belief that this lead ox, who is our brother, knows where to take us, knows how to get there, and will get us there every single time. Amen. I, you know, I just want to comment on that. When I was holding that yoke, I had perfect confidence that lead ox was going to go in the right direction. So I had perfect peace, I had perfect trust that he was going to take care of everything, and all I had to do was hang on. And that's kind of like our life with Christ. He's going to take care of it. Just hang on. Don't let go. All right. So it was on this day's lesson that um, this little dawning came to me. What makes the yoke light? And I think last week I mentioned we got a new puppy at our house. We have a little Australian shepherd puppy. And I get up in the middle of the night to let the dog out. And sometimes more than once. And... Uh, I got to thinking about this just a little bit. You know, the way that, that dog just has a little stub of a tail, it's a little female dog, and she is like the most devoted little ball of fur. And, you know, waking up at 1.30 and then 4.30, these are not things I really like to do. But, you know, I got talking with my wife. We have four children. All the inconveniences of raising those children, what made that work was the tremendous amount of love we had for those kids. And it is the love of Christ in our hearts that makes the burden light. And when we don't love, you can see why in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, Ephesians, first church that's rebuked, God says, this is what I have against you. You've lost your first love. Now, when I love somebody, whether it was falling in love with my wife or whatever, there wasn't a thing I did for her that was burdensome. And I'm not saying that in marriage, there aren't moments where it's like, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, there are those dynamics. But when as a church family, we love in the, with the eyes of Christ and the heart of Christ, our ministry to each other is the highest order of purpose. It is the line that Jesus leads us in. When we don't love, anything's a burden. And there are people who are in marriages that are a burden because they don't love each other anymore. And this is a tragedy because Christ intended that the soul stay free. And you stay free by letting God speak to you and making wrong right with your Father in heaven or with somebody on earth that you need to make it right. But when you keep everything out of the way, nothing between my soul and the Savior, and you have a heart that loves, the burdens aren't nearly as heavy. Now, Gethsemane was heavy. The cross was heavy. There's no doubt. But were we ever really a burden to Christ? It's like that story in Sealed Paddock of the boy who comes marching up on a cold winter day, carrying a big backpack, huffing and puffing, and the man says, boy, you've got a burden. You've got a heavy burden. He says, he ain't heavy, mister. He's my brother. And this is the dynamic of the Christian experience. Without love, it's all drudgery and duty. And with love, and I don't mean just emotional favor, I mean with a deep underlying commitment. That's, that, that suffers and sacrifices, but love makes the burden light. And fulfilling that love, being the heart that loves, the hands, the feet, the mouth, that lightens the burdens of life. Mark? Yeah, in, in that same vein, um, it's when we see and appreciate and accept that love of Christ and see how far he's come for us that gives us that love that we respond by saying... Lord, you've done so much for me. What, what can I say I can't do for you because you've gone so far? And I was actually thinking about this week when Peter, when we were talking about Peter and how um, 
Jesus said to him, you know, later on in life, you'll go where you didn't want to go. Well, he went as far as to go to the cross, which would have been hard enough and to say, no, I'm not only willing to go to the cross, but I'm willing to get crucified upside down because I don't deserve. That's love. I mean, there's no other way to, to explain that. How, why would you volunteer for that job description? Yeah, that's really beautiful thoughts. All right, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Gentleness is a underrated quality today, the paragraph says, starting the day's lesson. Humility is laughed at. Social media has taught us to pay attention to the loud, the noisy, the weird, and the wild, and the flamboyant. And truly, so many of the world's standards are the opposite of what God deems important and valuable. From Christ's object lesson, this quote, a knowledge of the truth depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose. This is, this is a powerful statement. I'm going to read it again. A knowledge of the truth depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose, the simplicity of an earnest, dependent faith to those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance, angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of truth. All right, so we have these texts here. How would you define meekness and humility based on these texts? Gentle and lowly of heart. How does it all fit in? What do we learn from some of these texts? All right, any thoughts? Okay, John, go ahead. Um, I think it kind of went into last week's lesson a little bit, a contrite heart, a heart that realizes that it has no power within itself unless it's submitted to God. And a meek heart is along that line. When you look at Moses, Moses was able to learn because he was able to give self up and let God teach him. And the times where he didn't was the times that he fell. And it's the same for us as well. So I, I think each one of these texts kind of point out that, that, that contrite heart, not necessarily like I'm so sorry all the time, but I realize who I am. I know who you are. I want more of you than I want of myself. And, and that is the heart that God could definitely work with. Yeah, I don't think a heart can be contrite until it understands the price paid for it by Jesus. But when yeah. we understand, it's like, you mean I'm of that value to God? I can be honest with myself. I'm not much, but, but I'm okay. I'll do what he asked me. I'll be what he's, he's asked me to be. I'm, I, it's a wonderful thing. He'd use me. And this amazing ability to see ourselves more honestly as we understand how God sees us and what he did for us is they're very related. And it's a wonderful thing to run into somebody who's not self-promoting and yet isn't self-deprecating either. They're just, they're okay, not with the fact that everything's perfect, but with the fact they're loved and they're growing and they're in Christ. Mark, it looks like you wanted to. Yeah, this, this um, quality, I think, in our society and our culture is just about disappeared uh, because I think meekness and humility uh, has been redefined as n being a doormat that I'm not going to be somebody's doormat. You can't tell me what to do. You can't um, push me around. And so there's that pushback that in society and culture today, uh, I just don't see it <laughs> uh, properly defined. But then when we compare again and look to Christ, who if anyone had uh, a right or um, a reason to throw his weight around, when he came down to this earth, it was Christ. And he would have been perfectly justified. And yet, he, you know, in, in Philippians 2, we read how he goes to the lowest point, not the highest. Good points. Now, it's important then, I guess, for just a little thought on lowliness of heart. To be non-self-promoting is not to be without confidence and understanding of relational law and respectability. So, all right. Pastor Page. You know, when you look at Christ's life, he was humble, but yet he would speak boldly, but always with kindness. You know, his heart was broken when he had to deal with true rebellion, but he did not, he did not come across as uh, somebody very stern and exacting, but he would come across with, you know, appealing to the heart to surrender and to, to yield to God's will because that was the best thing they could do. He really wanted to set them free. And as much as they, they, they dug their heels in, the more they dug their heels in, I would say, the greater his heart broke. 
Yeah, good point, Melody. Yes, um, unfortunately, meekness and gentleness is equated as weakness. And people look at you weak if you're gentle and meek, so nobody wants to be perceived as weak. And I thank the Lord for, that, for this um, analogy, actually. Um, as I was reading this, I was reminded of the times they were living in because the Romans were on them and they are always trying to, there's always breakouts of riots and trying to get away from this Roman yoke of bondage. And now I, God is calling them, there is a way, but you have to be, you have to follow me. You have to be gentle and meek. And just the sermon, this first service, the Romans are coming. God is again calling us to gentleness and meekness. So what would it have been like if you were forced to carry somebody's backpack and you came to the end of those 5,000 plus feet and you'd had a good conversation. It wasn't just, uh, this Roman's making me carry this backpack. But instead, you actually wanted to reach the Roman with the love of Jesus. And you get to the end of that mile and you say, you know what? I'd like to carry this for you one more mile. You, you told me I had to carry this the first mile. And Roman law says I have to do that. But I'd like to help you out. I know you've got a long ways to go today. And I'd like to carry it for you one more mile. Can you imagine how radical the love of Christ was to sow the seeds that produced a rich harvest inside the Roman army over time. You know, that makes me think about our interaction with people that come to us carrying a heavy burden. And, and we, we kind of, oh, do I really want to take the time to engage in this conversation? And how long will it take? And I'm really busy. But as you begin to enter into the dialogue with the person and, and, you, and you see their great need and you have the light to give them, to relieve them of their burden. And as you begin to share with them, you see the, the relief that begins to take place. You no longer start thinking about, my day's really busy, I gotta go, I gotta do this. But now it's like, wow, God's really reaching this person's heart through the things I'm sharing with them, the experiences. And, and there's the joy of going that extra mile. And you actually, want to make another appointment to connect with them again because you realize that you have something to give them to bring them hope, encouragement, and a, a better tomorrow. And so I want to encourage people, friends, as, you, as you're listening and thinking about this today, God's going to lead you to people often. And the enemy is going to say, you know what, you really don't have time. But I want to encourage you to take the time and help lift the burden as you lead them to Christ. Because actually Christ is lifting the burden. You're just being an instrument for him to work through. Yeah, so we don't think that in the days of Jesus that the men out plowing the fields that were called to carry these backpacks for the Romans had nothing to do. Living in a subsistence society, going an extra mile, was not only walking in the heat of the Judean sun, but it was getting, you know, two miles away from your little farmstead instead of one. All right, and actually, just taking the time to care is lifting a burden sometimes. All right, let's go on to my burden. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Let's tie off with both of these. Um, it's interesting that Paul would tell us to carry each other's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, let's go down to Wednesday's lesson. It says in Galatians 5.1, Paul wrote, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. What does that mean, and how does Christ make us free? What's the difference between the yoke he asks us to carry and the yoke of bondage that Paul warns us against? This will probably be where we end our lesson. Anybody want to comment? Go ahead, Mark. Well, they, they referred to the law, um, and again, it's really paganism in <laughs> a, a Judaism form where they said, you know, the way we're going to gain your acceptance, God, the way we're going to get in good with you again, or, or be saved, as we would say today, is by keeping the law. And, and, and so that was the yoke, that I can gain God's favor by keeping the law. By being good. So, man, if the devil's not got his fingers in that mess, mm -hmm. what does he have his fingers in? Because... The very thing we needed from Christ, we can't produce ourselves to give back to Jesus. We have to be loved and accepted and then return with love what only he can put in us to give back. All right, so folks, here we are at the end of another lesson, Rusting in Jesus. Listen, probably the heaviest burdens we carry are worry and fear for the future. 
And God is pretty inconvenient. He's going to bring things into our lives that allow us to take a step. So whatever that is for you today, let's take it. Let's not be in a bondage to uh, a a, a hybrid version of Christianity which makes God a good co-partner and we're the lead partner. Let's let Jesus be Lord. He'll take us a step at a time. Let's let him put love in our hearts to love. And may we give people the love he gives to us and may the burden be light and may the joy be great and may there be a fruitfulness to our efforts. All right, um, I'm going to ask Melody if you'd have a closing prayer for us. Let's pray. Our most gracious and kind, loving Heavenly Father, we just want to praise you and thank you that you're there and willing to take all the burdens that we willingly give up to you. Help us to see whatever else that we need to give up to you and bless us with your presence throughout this Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Sabbath School. We'll have a brief break before second service begins. God bless you and may you have a wonderful Sabbath.